pilots. Well, that's out of the way. Oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> it's going to be like, we get to move on to something fun. But we decided we're going to talk about Marlon Marais versus Jose Aldo. <laughs> so it's really no better. <laughs> Can we talk about Simone versus Font some more? No. I... Tell me about how excited you are to see Jose Aldo making <sighs> his cut to bantamweight. Isn't it what you've always wanted? Yeah, it's exactly the direction in which I wanted his weight class change to go. It's not even the fucking polar opposite. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Remember our remember our um, rules of when you should change weight class. You know, if you're starting to lose on cardio and pace, but you're an in, you're an invincible anti wrestler mm-hmm. who wants to strike, the logical thing for you to do is, of course, to go down to the lower division, particularly the one characterized as it is by nuclear powered punches uh-huh. with high pace. All right, everybody, I am back. Uh, normally, I would be back with my co-host, Chris Daffer. However, he had an emergency that he had to go take care of, uh, of somebody being hammered, which, uh, I mean, it happens. So we are going to, I'm going to try and run this solo. We will see how the fuck this goes. I have a feeling it's going to be a giant mess. Uh, but just to ensure that it is, because it's already, with me trying to run as many things as I am right now. I changed the the video setup. If you look that way, there's like a fucking poster there. I got some other shit I'm going to show in a minute. Uh, I'm also going to try and run the topology and the fight odds, all of this. It can only go poorly, I'm sure. And to ensure that, uh, I am going to hit what I picked up today, which is the Bear OG Wax Cigar. I don't You can kind of see that. Uh... So this is a dumb thing that I picked up today. It's a disposable uh, wax pen that looks like a cigar. Uh, it actually like literally looks quite a bit like a cigar. And when you hit it... Looks like a cigar, hits like fuck wax pen. So we will see how that's going to treat me during this episode. Um, I've been, I've been kind of digging it. I also picked up some Mega Queso Indica, which is some of the best fucking weed I've ever bought in my goddamn life. I wish I could remember. Here, let me... Fuck it. Since I'm doing this solo, I can do whatever I want. Mega Queso. Strain, which is popularized by Nameless Genetics. Um, And it is a hybrid strain that leaves users feeling sleepy, tingly, and relaxed. It's fucking fantastic i can't recommend it highly enough it's over there or else i would show you but it doesn't matter because that camera it would not focus well enough anyway um yeah i'm this pen is it's gonna i'm positive it's gonna get me in trouble during this but fuck it it's already chaos anyway i do really like that thing though that is uh that's my new go-to for outdoor vaping because it is pretty it's actually pretty it actually looks quite a bit like scar even up close um it's pretty decent got fake band with the bear and everything i i like it uh but anyway i also cracked open the new english zoom bar uh stout which is their imperial coffee stout made with zoom bar coffee i believe which is uh, right down the street from them if i remember right so uh, that is going to be fueling this, uh, this breakdown, which I did some tape study for. We my like I said, my week has been chaos. And then on top of that, I thought we were recording tomorrow morning rather than tonight, which in retrospect might've been a good idea, but we will go ahead and run with it. So, uh, I am going to go ahead and kick this off. We're going to break down this card from top, from bottom to top. Uh, this is the UFC on ESPN seven Overeem versus Rothwell card. Let me pop out the chat so I can see y'all. All right. That should work. Okay. So, theoretically, when I hit this button, 
everything will boom now we got prelims so uh, we're gonna start from the bottom uh, on the screen I have a warped version of the topology page that I'm gonna be looking at kind of uh, and we will start off here at the bottom so start off the card in DC this weekend we have Trevor hot sauce well first off uh, I Tito Ortiz is going to KO Alberto Del Rio in the first round it's going to be very fucking sad for everyone involved. Uh, okay, so to start off this card, Trevor Smith, Hot Sauce, is uh, with a record of 15-9, and nine, is taking on Mahmoud or Mahmoud Muradov, uh, whose nickname is Mock, and I'm only going to refer to him as Mock going forward. Uh, so Trevor Smith is coming off of back-to-back -back losses against Zach Cummings and Elias Theodoro. Prior to that, he had the win over Chris Camozzi and the loss to Andrew Sanchez. And Mock is coming off the recent win over Alessio DiCirico in a wild banger of a fight. Uh, prior to that, he had a couple wins in Octagon and Night of Warriors. Um, honestly, Mock looked really, really good in the Alessio DiCirico fight. It was a wild fucking just straight scrap the entire time. And I... I don't think Trevor Smith is going to be able to hang in the pocket consistently enough to survive this fight. Uh, Trevor, I think, he, I mean, he's going to look to try and push the clinch. That's what he does. He's very good at it. I don't know that he's going to be able to push the clinch without just getting blasted coming in. Um, and as a result, I got to take Mock via probably TKO. Um, I guess I'm going to lean in the first round. Fuck, that's what I forgot to do is set up the dock. Give me a second. Let me make this happen. Also, I do not have Chris's picks either because he literally got a call while we were about to start and was like, oh, by the way, I have to fucking drive to La Jolla right now. So, as a result, this will actually, I think, be the only card of the year where, uh, where Chris, holy fuck! Uh, this will, I think, this will be the only card of the year where we don't have both of our picks, and it's too bad because looking back on the last card we covered, which was the UFC Sao Paulo card, Chris and I went. Uh, let's see, I went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one and one, and Chris went nine, two and one. Which is pretty goddamn impressive. That was one. I almost. I was. I was a draw and a fucking Perez sub away from having a perfect card, which I am pretty happy about. Even if that was the only redeeming part of that entire fucking Sao Paulo card. Um, so I should have been creating this while I was talking, but instead I did not. Where the fuck? Okay. Uh, you'll see DC. Sorry about this. This is normally what I do when we are on break. Oh no. Why is this not just the easiest fucking thing ever? Fucking come on, Wikipedia. See, this is all the all the fun stuff you guys normally get to miss out on when uh. I can just let Chris fucking ramble while I'm trying to do all this on the fly. All right, we got that. I got that. All right, okay. All right, okay. We are ready to go. So I got uh, Mokmed Muradov over Trevor Smith. I'm going to go TKO. I'm going to go second. I think, Trevor Smith will, I think Trevor Smith will have some success early. Um, I just think over and over again, he's going to start getting worn down by getting constantly picked apart when he tries to enter, uh, and having trouble at all hanging on the outside. Uh, so yeah, that's the way I'm leaning on that one. To be fair, I am pretty inconsistent with Trevor Smith fights as far as I can remember. I, he's a dude who, I uh, did get the Elias Theodoro fight right, but also it's an Elias Theodoro fight. So what does that really mean in the long run? Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, up next, we got Verna Janjiroba, 14-1, taking on Mallory Martin, 6-2. Verna Janjiroba is coming off of the lost Carlos Sparza in a pretty competitive fight. 
Uh, it was a very competitive fight, I should say. Uh, before that, she had the win over Janessa Moranjan uh, via arm triangle in the second and Invicta 31, and the win over Mizuki in a way via split decision prior to that. Mallory Martin is coming off of the win. Oh, that's right. I forgot she fought an Invicta also after the Contender Series fight. Uh, she's coming off the win over Cynthia Arcio, but prior to that, she had the win over Mikol DeSigny. I'm probably butchering that. I know I'm butchering that because I've heard that girl's name pronounced. I just can't remember. Uh, she had that win in Contender Series. She looked good. She also just kind of kickboxed from range and didn't have a lot of success with the takedowns. And that's kind of my main hesitation coming into this. Um, I, I've heard just about everyone picking these fights say that if Mallory Martin doesn't get top control, she's going to have a lot of trouble in this fight. And I tend to agree. I think even if she does have to get top control, Bernard Jandjaroba is real slick on the ground. She hit a dope sweep on Carlos Sparza, uh, straight to mount. I believe it was straight to mount a guillotine. It was real slick. Um, I I like Mallory Martin a lot. She's real young in her career still, though. Um, while she does have a lot of Amy fights, she's not. You can tell her game is still kind of evolving, and a lot of her early wins were her just getting on top of girls who couldn't wrestle as well and pounding them out. Uh, especially that, like the Ashley Nichols one, is the the per, like the well known example of it, where she's on top of that girl, yet telling her uh, whatever she yelled in the in the fucking contender series fight. I forgot she did that. The uh, no one can save you. She yelled that also in the contender series fight, but it was like between round or it was like at the start of a round, and she it was also just like a competitive kickboxing, a range kickboxing fight. It was a weird move and kind of forced. Uh, I think Vernon Jandjaroba is going to absolutely light Mallory Martin up on the feet, especially kickboxing range. I uh, Mallory Martin does tend to dip to one side a bit as well, so. I could see her getting caught with a kick. Um, I think this probably goes to decision. I was going to say I think it goes to decision, but now that I'm thinking about it, I might actually take Verna via sub. I'm not sure. Yeah. Nah, I don't know. Yeah, you know what? I'm not. I'm going to take Verna via decision. I think Mallory Martin will hang in there and make it scrappy. I think Mallory Martin may actually steal around, depending on uh, what Verna looks like in the third. Mallory generally is able to keep her cardio fairly well. Um, obviously, much better at doing that when she's able to get top control and kind of ride her opponent out and, and pound him out. But, yeah, I'm leaning Verna just to absolutely... Box Mallory up, uh, not even box, but especially specifically kickbox her up at range, and cause a lot of problems anytime Mallory tries to get inside. Um, and I also think even if Mallory does get Verna down, there's a decent chance Verna catches it or, or something. If, if not a sweep, a sub. Um, so I'm gonna go Verna via decision, but I I could see it going sub as well. Uh, oh, right, and I'm doing odds also. God, see, I'm, this is going to... Here, cheers. You can tell that fucking wax pen works. My eyes are pretty not open. Uh, so, Miradov, holy shit. Mock is a... I forget who he is. Whatever, we're using Bovada. Uh, Mock is a minus 450 favorite. Jesus, goddamn Christ. Okay. I mean, I get it, I guess, but that seems wide. Also, Verna Janjaro, but minus 300 seems pretty wide, too. Uh, I get why they're both favorites. I, I'm obviously leaning those directions as well. Oh, boy, this card has some pretty wide odds on it. And then some just dead even fights. This is going to be interesting. Uh, but, yeah, I'm leaning Verna pretty, pretty heavily. All right, speaking of fights, I'm leaning pretty heavily on one side of. Up next, we got Matt Wyman taking on Joe Selecki. Matt Wyman, 16-8, and eight, coming off the loss to Violent Bob Ross via third-round ground and pound after just getting completely shit-kicked for that entire fight. Um, 
man, it was a that was a rough, rough fight. Prior to that, he had not fought for five fucking years, in which case he fought uh, prior Isaac Valley Flag for that TJ Grant and Paul Sass. Mac Danzig, Dennis Seaver. Oh, getting getting nostalgic for early 2010s MMA. Oh, man, those are some fucking names I have not heard in a while. Cole Miller. Ugh. Man, that wax pin was probably a bad idea. Okay, and he's taking on Joe Selecki, 8-2. Selecki is coming off the win over James Wallace in the Contender Series. Prior to that, he has wins in CFFC, Ring of Combat. Damn, wins in Ring of Combat and CFFC is pretty, that's pretty dope East Coast uh, combo right there. Also has a couple, couple Amy fights. No real names that are standing out to me on his record, although that's probably also because I'm not, I'm, I, I don't follow a ton of East Coast, uh, of East Coast regional sh- promotions, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't take Matt Wyman in the year 2019, y'all. I can't do it. Just like he looked good in the contender series fight. Um, I just, I just have zero faith in Matt Wyman to not get blasted by Joe Selecki. He, he, Joe Selecki's got pretty, pretty quick hands. Looked pretty good uh, at just bombing on dude early in that fight before he caught that choke that he was able to put him out with. Uh, I forget who the oh, James Wallace. That guillotine was nasty, but also that dude did nothing to defend it when he went when he went for it. Like zero hand fighting. It was fucking brutal. Um, yeah, I guess my question is: Does Matt Wyman get knocked out, or does he does he get club and subbed? I'm gonna go KO'd. I guess I don't know. I don't feel good about this pick. It doesn't make me happy. But then again, this matchmaking doesn't necessarily make me happy either. Although I guess I don't know who else you're gonna have Matt Wyman fight. I don't know. Hopefully, I'd like to see Matt Wyman kind of. Sh- hopefully, he looks better in this performance. And and to be fair, they should have never matched him up against Val Bob Ross. That's a fucking insane matchmaking. That is uh, almost almost criminal. So. Definitely taking Joe Selecki. And I'm guessing he's a big favorite on the odds. Yeah. Joe Selecki's a minus 350 favorite. Yeah. He should be. Uh, I guess I'm going to go KO. I'm going to go KO first. Because I think if Joe Selecki doesn't get him out in the first, I, I don't know that he'll get him out after that unless it's just with a sub. Um, Because... At least based off his one contender series fight that I that I saw, dude throws a lot of fucking power and a lot of effort behind every shot, um, and is super explosive. So, yeah, I'm gonna lean select EV a KO first. I don't know. Uh, up next, we got oh my god, we got Bryce Mitchell, who told the most ridiculous ass story on TSN MMA show this week. I think I forgot to mention that during the first segment. Jesus Christ, maybe go listen to that. It's if you if you I, I'm not an animal rights activist, but even I was like, Jesus, bro, probably don't be saying that on air because people are not going to be happy. I don't feel good about what you're saying. And then the story does not get better. It, and it, the lackadaisical manner he talks about it with, oh my God, let's just say it involves a deer. <laughs> it's a it was a thing I I don't know go listen to it if or don't maybe don't listen to it uh, but Bryce Mitchell thug nasty 11 and0 best known for taking a screwdriver to his dick or I guess balls technically uh, let's take on Matt say sales uh, Robo Bryce Mitchell is coming off of the win over Bobby Moffitt and prior to that, he has the win over Tyler Diamond and the loss to Brad Katona in the Ultimate Fighter. Oh, yeah, they're right. The Tyler Diamond one was the finale. Uh, yeah, that Brad Katona fight still surprises me. Uh, and he's taking on Matt Sales. Matt Sales is fighting out of Alliance. Uh, Dominic Cruz, protege. Coming off the win over Kyle Nelson via Arm Triangle in the third. Prior to that, he had the loss to Shaman Marais. 
in the win over Yazan Haja. Oh, also, I saw him fight down here. I saw him fight Christian Aguilera at CFFC 64 back in the day. Uh, when they did the, an event in San Diego, which is pretty dope. Um, I've been going back and forth on this fight all week. I like Bryce Mitchell, but I don't know that I have faith in Bryce Mitchell to do anything but what his opponent wants. In that, I think he just fights whatever game his opponent gives him. I don't think he game plans going into fights. I don't think he's going to game plan coming into this one. I did hear him talk about how he's bulked up a bit. Uh, he's actually cutting weight for this fight. Which, while that that does sound good, also worries me a bit because I think his major advantage in this fight would have been the cardio edge. Uh, cause I think Matt Sales is going to definitely have the better hands. And if he's able to shut down a lot of Bryce Mitchell's uh, grappling initiations, it's not the word I was looking for, but I'll go with it. Um, if he's able to shut down the entries on a lot of the grappling exchanges from Bryce Mitchell, I think Bryce Mitchell, will, especially with now having a bigger weight cut, could flag pretty hard, um, or at least hard enough to where Matt Sales is able to put, keep putting it on him over and over again. They're both tough as nails. I think this is definitely only a decision either way. I'm leaning Matt Sales. Um, also, uh, who blew weight? Who the fuck blew weight in this fight? Featherweight, 148. Why, why doesn't... Why is nobody... Alright, let's do it this way. Sales miss weight. Okay, definitely taking sales then. Because uh, with Bryce Mitchell now having a bigger weight cut and sales not cutting as much weight, that just makes me double down on the fact that Bryce Mitchell will probably be the more tired dude going towards the end of the second, beginning of the third. So, yeah, I'm definitely taking sales via decision. All right, Billy Quarantillo. I'm next. Taking on... Where are we? Jason Kilburn. This is about as far as my tape study went, but luckily I at least know everyone else on the card, actually. Nice. That worked out well. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I mentioned it on the first segment, but having Fight Pass have all the fights that were previously only on ESPN Plus has been a... It's so much easier to do tape study. So uh, I will actually start doing more consistent tape study going forward. Promises that I'm hopefully going to keep. Um, so, Billy Quarantillo. Sorry, Jacob Kilburn, the killer. Boy... Uh, fucking nicknames in MMA. He is coming off of the win over Giovanni's J. Ross uh, in Island Fights. Prior to that, he had the win over Davison Hibiero and the loss to Bobby Moffitt on Contender Series. Billy Quarantillo is coming off the win over Kamula Kirk on Contender Series. For that, he has a bunch of wins in King of the Cage. And uh, was previously on Ultimate Fighter Season 22 back in the day. Who the fuck was Season 22? Oh, McGregor Faber. Oh, Jesus. I remember Billy Quarantillo now. I thought I remembered him more than just from Contender Series. That makes sense. Uh, man, I don't know. I, I'm leaning towards Billy Quarantillo off experience. I'm not real confident either way. Uh, Jacob Kilburn did look real good in island fights. He just smoked a dude from what I remember. Um, but Billy Quarantillo has fought at least recognizable competition. I say that. Now he fought Michael Quinones. Oh, it's Michelle Quinones. Is that the same dude I'm thinking of? The jiu-jitsu? Nope, that's not, not the same dude. Uh, man, and Jason Kilburn does have the fight against Bobby Moffat. Yeah, I don't know. I'm MMA mathing the fuck out of this because I kind of don't know what to make of either one of these guys. I'm leaning towards Billy Quarantillo. I think he's a little bit more well-rounded. Also, if I remember right, yeah, he is fighting, I think, out of Florida. Yeah, he is fighting out of Florida because I think he trains at the same gym as, uh, 
as Bill Welker from MMA on the Rocks. I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, I'm leaning that way. Uh, just off of experience, basically. I would not be surprised either way, though. Um, I think it should be a fun fight. Both dudes come and, come, come and bang, so... On that note, I guess I'll hit this again because that can't make things worse. Also, I forgot to read odds on the sales fight, didn't I? You can tell this is going it's going so, so well. Uh, yeah, Matt Sales, slight favorite. It makes sense. Minus 130 over Bryce, uh, plus 100, Bryce Mitchell. Billy Quarantillo, minus 335 to a plus 255 of Kilburn. I haven't seen enough of Kilburn's tape, to be honest, uh, that I would be able to see that he should be that big, big a favorite, but... Doesn't necessarily surprise me. Uh, oh, actually, let me hit this uh, sweet cigar pen while I go ahead and change the image that we have. Since we, Oh, no, wait. We saw one more prelim fight. Oh, man. How is Tim Means versus Tiago Alves on the prelims? Actually, looking at... The, well, yeah, I get it, but I don't know. Maybe, well, anyway, I could see another fight of a heavier weight class that could probably be further down, but, oh, I'm going to try not to cough on that. Oh, <coughs> 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 oh no. <coughs> <coughs> oh, that was a bad idea. Whoo, chasing it with, uh, what is this, a 9% stout? That was not my best idea either. It's all uphill from here, guys. Or downhill? I always fuck that expression up. <clears throat> Fucking, we're, we're completely off the wagon. All right. Tiago Alves is taking on 10 means. I am pretty goddamn excited for this fight. Um, mostly because I don't know where... I don't know what to make of Tim Means right now. Tim Means looked really good in that Nico Price fight up until he got absolutely deaded by him. And Tiago Alves is absolutely that veteran who ha is having trouble pulling the trigger enough to win decisions at this point in his career. I mean, just consistently having trouble pulling the trigger. Um, it's definitely something you start seeing in veterans, especially dudes who rely on their striking. And I believe it was Dan Tom this week. Fuck, I should have mentioned protecting neck. That was one of the ones I forgot to mention earlier as well. Dan Tom had a, a pretty solid episode this week as well. But he pointed out that a lot of Tiago Alves' leg kicks don't have nearly the same power they did. <coughs> Excuse me. See, that's why I, you should not hit a pin and try and host a show solo. <clears throat> Especially since I'm coming off a cold. It's going great. It's going great. I know everybody loves hearing get, hearing people cough right in their ear. Uh, but yeah, Tiago Alves, he, earlier in his career, he, he had much more devastating leg kicks. It seems like he's kind of opted more towards speed nowadays, but he also has really, really lowered his, not only his volume, but... Just his willingness to kind of just play defensively and then try and pot shot here and there. He just consistently loses rounds by dudes throwing at him, which is always frustrating to watch. It's something that uh, I'm trying to think of some other people. Like Ross Pearson had this had some issues with that towards the end of his UFC run. Just there's some guys. There's a couple others. I, it's all it gets depressing the more you go through it because it's always dudes who have gone through a lot of wars and who just have trouble pulling the trigger. Um, and I, it, it seems to be a bit of that with Tiago Alves, at least from what I've noticed. Uh, then again, you're when you're fighting dudes like Loriano Sarapoli, who's just gonna throw mad volume at you anyway. It's not gonna make it much better. But Tim Means is also that dude. Tim Means is the guy who was throwing mad volume and hitting Nico Price with every single piece of it up until Nico Price did Nico Price shit. Uh, he, prior to that, had the win over Ricky Rainey via ground and pound, and then the back-to-back -back losses against Sergio Moraes, split decision, and Bilal Muhammad, split decision. 
Man, those look really good in retrospect. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely taking Tim Means. I don't think he can finish. I mean, I, he could finish Thiago Alves. I just think Thiago Alves is too much of a vet and is not going to be willing enough to stand in the pocket to just get absolutely creamed by Means. So I'm going to take... I'm going to take Means via decision uh, pretty cleanly. The only way I see... I mean, Means does eat a lot of leg kicks, but I just don't think Thiago Alves is going to be able to land enough of them consistently. And even if he does, I think Means is going to just use that as an opportunity to walk forward and throw a four-piece over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's just going to be trouble in the long run. So... I think it'll be a fun fight either way, but definitely leaning towards Tim Means in this one. I'm guessing he's a pretty considerable favorite in this. Yeah, minus 270 to a plus 210. Sounds about right to me. I'm really high, so I'm going to move that wax pan right over there. You guys can see my eyes just slowly disappear and turn into the same color as the back, as the wall behind me. Um, let's see. I'm just going to keep on moving on. This step's not helping either. All right, up next. Oh, we're on to the main card. So let me do this cool switch. How about this move? Boom, boom. Main card. I'm doing video effects. In it's By the way, if you guys are not watching, these video effects are ghetto as fuck. It's not... Oh, boy. I'm barely holding it together. All right. Keep on moving on. Where are we at? Rob Font taking on Ricky Simone. Way. Uh, Rob Font, 16-4. and four. Coming off the win over Sergio Pettis, which was a big win. I forgot about that fight. Uh, so this is where I, we officially hit the part where I stopped doing tape study. Uh, prior to that, he had the loss to Rafael Sunset via decision, like most people in that division. And then he had the win over Thomas Almeida via head kick and punches. Ricky Simone, 15-2, and two, fighting out of Gracie Baja. No, he's not fighting out of Gracie Baja, Portland. He's fighting out of ATT, Portland. Uh, what's up, Topology? Uh, he's coming off the loss via overhand right to Favor. Because if Favor's going to win a fight, that's how it's going to happen. And he got so excited when he caught Favor early that he walked right into it, unfortunately. Uh, prior to that, he had the win over Hani Yaya and Montel Jackson and Marab. Uh, kind of. The Marab one. That was the infamous. Did Marab, was Marab out or was he just kicking for crazy Euro, Euro sake? Um, it was, uh, that shit's still weird. I still don't know how I feel about that whole exchange. Uh, but I'm a big Ricky Simone fan. If for no other reason, he is, uh, He's constantly either making fun of or being made fun of by the writer of the fighter guys out there in Oregon with Jake Smith and David Golden. And uh, he's he's been on the show. I, I think him and Jake did a show with Joel back in the day as well. Uh, so pretty, pretty fucking funny. I enjoyed it quite a bit. <sighs> I mean, I'm taking Ricky Simone. I don't know why. I think... I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm. I sleep on Rob Font in a lot of ways. He has really solid wins that I probably don't give enough credit to. I, I just don't know what to make of his game. Um, I think Ricky Simone just does a lot of things well. I think he's going to push pace. I think he's going to get back to his wrestling. Uh, and I think if he just repeats that over and over again, not just the wrestling, but working from wrestling, throwing a couple strikes, working going back down, changing levels. I think if he works that against Rob Font for two rounds, Rob Font starts to fade and Ricky can take the last two. Um, I think that'll be an interesting kind of... It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Cause I think that's from the hints that I've heard here and there from a couple different places. Uh, I feel like it's pro he's probably leaning that way. <clears throat> Even though he did real well on the feet against... Uh, against Faber early, he definitely, it's, it seems like he's going to get back to his wrestling. And against a dude like Rob Font, that could get interesting because I'm not sure how they're going to match up. Also, Rob Font's, I believe, quite a bit bigger. Uh, he definitely has a height advantage. About the no, reach advantage isn't much, so 
that'll be interesting to see how that goes. But I'm pretty excited about this fight overall. Uh, but I got Ricky via decision. All right, coming up next, it's the Battle of the Cocks. The Flower Cock versus Song and Dong. Uh, all right, so... I just keep making the Conor Rebus joke over and over again because it, it really, it's it makes me laugh every time. I don't know why. The phrase flower cock, I think, is really is really the best part about it. Also, I do like that Jack Slack has also started making more references towards it. It's pretty. It makes me, I'm a fucking four-year-old, you guys. It makes me laugh every time. So, Cody, this went off the win over Alejandro Perez, part of that. You got Solov stretched by Aljamain Sterling in the second. Then you had wins uh, over Brian Caraway and Tom Dukenwa. God damn, that is a stretch of fucking fights. Uh, Song Yadong uh, is coming off the win over Alejandro Perez as well, where he absolutely fucking melted him. Prior to that, he had the wins over Vince Morales, Felipe Aranches, and that dude's name, Kandare. Uh, uh, I can pronounce that part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I gotta take Song Yudong. I gotta take Yudong, I gotta go with Yudong, and I gotta stay with Yudong. Uh, I, I, I do think Cody, if this fight goes three rounds, Cody Stamen's winning the third round. That's, I'm not even worried about, that. 100% I'm convinced that's gonna happen. Uh, cause I think if it goes three rounds, Cody's working enough his wrestling game, that's probably taken a lot out of both song and himself i think cody i think cody would have the better gas i think if cody's wrestling game does not work in the first round i think he probably is gonna run into a lot of trouble and slow down pretty significantly uh and that's why i'm gonna take uh song Yudong with the ko in the second i think he's i, I believe he's gonna cause a, not only a lot of problems early um, but as soon as he starts stuffing takedowns and throwing hard counters, I think it's just going to start wearing more and more on Cody's where he has less and less options. Um, I think he, he's definitely going to have the cleaner striking out of the two and the, the way scarier striking. Um, again, I think the only way, unless Cody's able to get Yudong up against the fence and really just grind on it, uh, him, uh, either way, um, I, I think it's going to be a tough night, so... I'm going to take you, Dong. Via KO in a second. John Morgan's right. There's no there's no good way. Uh, let's see. Odds on that. Oh, I didn't do the odds on the Ricky fight. Oh, Ricky's a plus 115 underdog to a minus 145 favorite. That sounds about right because I am fairly biased in that fight, I feel like. Uh, also, I don't know if I said the 10 means is a minus 270 favorite to a plus 210 underdog of Tiago Alves. Uh, yeah, that all sounds about right. I can see why Rob Font's favorite. He definitely has hands. And I think, but I think people are sleeping on, sleeping on Ricky just because of the favor thing. And I think that's silly to do. Because he, he literally just clipped dude and just split second decision, rushed in and got caught. Uh, I think that's... Dude's real young in his career, and I think that's going to be a big learning experience for him. I think it, he's going to come out on fucking fire in this fight. All right, so up next, another fucking fantastic fight. I'm actually really looking forward to this one. This is Invicta main event all over it, and I mean that in the best of ways. Uh, Aspen Ladd, 8-1, and one, taking on Yana Kunitskaya, who's 12-4. and four. Aspen Lads coming off the loss to Jermaine Durandamy via getting smashed with a right in the first round, like immediately. I uh, also felt real good about that pick. I fucking nailed that one. However, I did not nail uh, the fact that she got the decision win over Sajari Eubanks, although now that I say that out loud, I would argue you should go back and watch that fight. Uh, I, I To be fair, I don't think I've picked an Aspen Lad fight ever. Uh, correctly, except for the Jermaine Duran and me one. Uh, I probably had her over Lena Landsberg. Um, but yeah, the Tanya Evinger fight, Jesus Christ. She just absolutely smashed Tanya Evinger. I, I really liked Aspen Ladd through her Invicta run. It was 
ultra impressive. Uh, I thought she would face more trouble in the UFC, especially against Tony Evinger, for example. I thought she was it was going to be a real rough matchup for her. Completely broke, blew the doors off Tony Evinger. Then came back and had went just had fucking wild punching exchanges with Sajari Eubanks, which I did not expect her to do. And uh, that was a wild fight. I'm not sure that she won it, but it was a crazy, crazy, uh, just a crazy scrap. So it'll be interesting against Yana Kuniskaya. Yana, you guys probably know from the Tanya Evinger armbar debacle. Uh, this is the infamous one where Tanya, she catches Tanya for the Invicta title. She catches Tanya in the armbar. Tanya then puts her foot on her face to try and get leverage, and Mike England is doesn't know the rules, so he stops the fight after whining about it. Uh, and that was one of the rare overturns uh, that you'll ever see in a from an athletic commission, which they uh, turned into a no contest. They then rematched, and Tanya Evinger basically pounded her out for two rounds and then got the RNC. Uh, she also then f- went on to fight Chris Cyborg, and, I mean, Chris Cyborg did Chris Cyborg things. She got the win over Lena Landsberg, and she did get the win over Marion Renault. However, that win over Marion Renault, if I remember right, was the one where Marion Renault had some of the... It was the most frustrating fight IQ that I've seen in a while, if I remember right, uh, some of the decisions that she made in that fight. So, I I just think Aspen Ladd probably ends up on top at some point in this fight. And if Aspen Ladd ends up on top, I don't think Yana's going to catch her with an arm bar. And if she doesn't catch her with an arm bar, I think she's probably just going to get pounded out. Um, also, Aspen Ladd's real good. I, Jack Slack actually points this out a lot. Aspen Ladd's one of the, the women who are very good at yelling while they're throwing ground and pound, which scares the refs. Uh, and so they get finishes more often. It's like the opposite of what Habib does, where he talks just loud enough to where people can hear it, but it's not like yelling. Whereas the Mallory Martin Aspen Lad version, where you're ye- screaming at your opponent, uh, it definitely does not hurt TKO stoppages. Probably assist them a bit. Uh, I think that's probably how this is going to go. I'm going to take Aspen Lad. It, it, this could very easily go to decision. Um,. I don't remember if it was Zane Simon or Phil McKenzie who pointed out that Aspen Ladd may very well just try and kickbox for the first round like she likes to do, and that kind of worries me a bit. Um, Because I think Yana Kuniskaya is probably not the better striker out of the two, but Yana Kuniskaya also will throw head kicks, and Aspen Ladd seems pretty susceptible to head kicks uh, just based on the fact that she kind of just puts her chin down and tries to eat a lot of stuff on the forehead coming in. So, I think that's something to keep an eye on. But, yeah, I got Aspen Ladd probably to end up on top. If she works a, a wrestling game at all in the first round, I think she gets the TKO in the second. I think she probably gets the TKO in the second. I think she probably ends up on top, starts throwing ground and pound, looks at the ref, starts yelling and throwing more ground and pound, and uh, gets the finish. will be interesting to see, though, if... If Aspen Ladd does not like does try and push a takedown game uh, and loses some grappling exchanges, Yana is real slick on the ground. Um, the problem is she relies a lot on catching arm bars from bottom. So I think that is... That's a, that's a game that is... You, you live by that sword, you die by that sword. Uh, not everyone can have Cindy Dandwa's incredible record for doing that, which I still don't... I still don't quite understand, but what are you going to do? Uh, so Aspen Ladd is a minus 160 underdog, or sorry, favorite to a plus 130 Yannick Kuniskaya. I think that's probably a little conservative. Um, I would have thought she'd be like in the 230s. So I part of that probably is because just because of the GDR fight, but those are not really comparable in my opinion, so. That's uh, that's interesting. That is, uh, I would maybe take a look at that. I wonder what Aspen led by TKO is, or by stoppage. Uh, Aspen led by TKO. Okay, uh, it's plus three eighty four is not great. TKO. 
I mean, it's fine, but I would have expected more for it. Kuniskaya by submission is fucking thirteen fifty. I mean, if you if you like, like uh, Chad folks or Ben Dundas, as I uh, often accidentally say, as uh, Ben folks or Chad Dundas would say, yeah, if you have ten dollars, you never want to see again. Yannick Kuniskaya via sub is not your the worst way to spend your money. This is why this is why I don't bet much. This is like I'll bet here and there. But I always end up going back, you know, that what a weird prop bet looks pretty dope. Like, what if they do play that song during the intro and then I happen to get paid for it? That sounds great. Anyway, uh, let's see. So up next, we got Stefan Struve versus Ben Rothwell. Holy shit, you guys, it's 2006 again. Uh, good God. Okay, not 2006. What was it? 2008? 10? Jesus, it was, only, it was actually almost... Wow. Holy fuck. I forgot Seven is true for Paul Blintello. Cause you, there's some weird transition periods between the Sierras sometimes. And you get shit like Chase Gormley versus Steven Struve in 2009. Oh my god. Uh, um, anyway, Steven Struve, the skyscraper, 29-11. Coming out of retirement to... Well, did he... He, he retired. Did he retire? It was, like, it was a kind of retirement. He took his gloves off, but then said he might fight again, if I remember right. Anyway, he's hanging on Ben Rothwell, 36-12. and 12. God damn, Ben Rothwell. That is a, that is a solid record. Uh, or at least more solid than I would have expected. He's coming off the decision losses to Andre Olowski, Blagoy Ivanov, and Junior Dos Santos. It went all the way back to April of 2016. Last win was Josh Barnett with that go-go choke, which was dope as fuck. Holy shit, I can't believe that was back in January 2016. Uh, that was a long goddamn time ago. Anyway. Oh, so... It, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm taking Ben Rothwell because it's a Stefan Struve and Ben Rothwell fight. In the... Unless Ben Rothwell just decides not to walk forward and throw giant right hands like he likes to do. Or le or left hand. Just walk forward and throw hands in general. Uh, I don't know how Stefan Struve wins this fight. Ben Rothwell just walks forward and eats shots. So, like... I don't necessarily think he's going to walk into anything from Stefan Struve that is going to put him out. And he's going to walk forward and just throw big shots at Stefan Struve, which is the game plan I would advise. So, uh, I got Ben Rothwell via KO probably. To be fair, Stefan Struve, well, it's Andre Olofsky, Marcin Tybura, and Marcus Hagerio de Lima. I mean, to be fair, outside of Volkov, Seven True hasn't been KO'd, like, badly in a long time. That's interesting. I guess it, it's, it's just, the couple real bad ones are just so cemented in everyone's minds. Huh. Oh, my God. What if this fight goes to decision? Could you imagine what that's going to look like? All right, well... Since I hate everything, I have to root for rough, rough MMA. Uh, and I don't mean Gruff the Crime Dog. I mean, uh, some, this, I have a feeling this fight's going to make some people real salty. So I'm going to take Rothwell via a very, very, very rough decision. Uh, in which case, he maybe loses the first round and then just walks forward throwing at but not necessarily landing on seven true over and over again uh i don't know i don't know i don't have many feelings about this fight but none of them are that positive the ones i do uh cynthia calvillo is taking or calvijo if you're luke thomas is taking on marina rodriguez cynthia is eight and one she's coming in five over five pounds overweight don't know what the fuck happened there she got Marina Rodriguez, who's two or is twelve zero and one, and I so 
I'm just I, I do know that Cynthia Calvillo, I believe, did take this fight on relatively short notice, if I remember right. However, yeah, because this was originally supposed to be Livia Nata Souza. No, no, it was originally supposed to be Claudia Gedalia, who dropped out because of an injury. Um, however, Cynthia Calvillo being bigger in this fight is a big advantage because I think Marina Rodriguez is going to have a pretty significant size advantage. Uh, she's got, what, a two-inch height advantage? And it's only an inch reach advantage. She just seems much bigger, and a, I don't know that uh, Cynthia missing weight is the worst thing for her chances in this fight, honestly. Um, I think Cynthia has to be able to get Marina down. I don't think she can win a fight at range, uh, and I'm worried she's going to get stuck in the clinch in the in the interim and really run into trouble. Uh, so I'm going to take Marina Rodriguez in this. I <sighs> Cynthia missing weight is a real X factor because it, theoretically that would give her the cardio advantage, which I think would probably give her the third round in this fight, um, just based on the matchup. And the fact that I think it's going to be a super physical fight with a lot of just pushing and, and grappling exchanges in the clinch and just really like a rough fight, uh, like just a lot of clashing. And so I'm leaning towards Marina Rodriguez in that just because I, Marina Rodriguez has shown real well that she is does pretty well in the clinch. She's very good at digging under hooks. She showed over and over against, against Teacher Torres, uh, which is why I had her in that fight. As one of my uh, one of my favorite or one of my uh, more prominent or prescient rather picks that I came across last year, I think. But yeah, I, I think overall Marina Rodriguez is going to be tough for Cynthia Calvillo, just because I think if Calvillo doesn't get her to the ground, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of effort she's going to have to spend trying to not just consistently get beat up in that short uh, pocket exchange range also I'd like to state for the record I'm I almost reached for that pen again while literally about to say I'm pretty fucking high right now so I should not do that um what did I say oh yeah Rodriguez by decision obviously uh and she is the slight favorite actually minus 140 to a plus 110 on Bovada that's that's wider than I would think. Um, it's actually interesting. Especially with Calvillo missing weight. Huh. That's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, anyway. Uh, then we're on the main event. Man, I don't know what to make of this fight. Alistair Overeem taking on Jairzinho Rosenstreich. Alistair Overeem 45 and 17. God damn that record. Uh, he's coming off the win over Alexi Olnik. Prior to that, he has the win over Sergei Pavlovich in the back-to-back -back losses against Curtis Blades and Francis Ngannou, in which he got Pez dispensered. Uh, Jerzyna Rosenstreich, 9-0. Jesus, that record disparity is crazy. Uh, he has wins over, he's coming off wins over Andre Olovsky, where he melted him in the first uh, last month. And then he has the win over Alan Crowder and Junior Albini. Man, I don't, I don't know. Like, Alistair Overeem should definitely win this fight. But also, what if he just gets hit? You know? Like, what if, what if Rosenstruck just hits him? I, 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 don't, I don't mean to sound dumb about this, but like, honestly... That's kind of like Alistair Overeem has a ton of ways to win this. I'm just worried that he's going to do the panicky thing where he either tries to just play a weird outside game and a lot of like turning and running, and then the first exchange he does go for is super panicked and just gets smashed, or that he will just walk forward and try and grab a clinch and get clipped hard on the on the button. Um, I'm going to take Alistair Overeem because I, I, I have to, it's Alistair Overeem. 
uh, and it's Jerzinho Rosenstrike. But Jerzinho Rosenstrike is a bad motherfucker. If you guys have not seen some of his glory fights, good God, uh, you are missing out on some ultra violence. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm gonna take Reem probably via. S- I was gonna say sub. Probably via TKO in the second. Second or third. I'm leaning second. Um, I think it's either going to be he, he Reem ends up on top of him or Reem is able to finally catch him in the clinch. Because I think I don't have confidence that Jerzinho can survive extended. Like, I don't, I don't know that that dude has much cardio. He hasn't really had to prove a ton of it. Um, and the Kovla fight is not. If you go back and watch that, it is not a great example of him having awesome cardio and winning that. Um, so, I'm going to take Reem via KO in the second. But, boy, that is a fight I would not bet on with anything. Uh, so, let's see. What are the odds on that? Reem's got to be a favorite, right? Oh, then, wow, it's dead fucking even at minus 115. Checks out. Cool, man. Well, we will go ahead and wrap this up here, but this has been a lot of fun. Um, Let's see. So if you guys want to check us out, you can go to thesoundofviolence.com. That's where we have all the info, uh, including we have all the show notes of all the podcasts we talked about and links to all that stuff. So check that out. Uh, Subscribe on YouTube. That helps us out a ton. It helps out a whole lot, actually. Uh, Evidently. I don't know. Uh, but you can get notified from when we put up shows because we go live at crazy fucking times and sometimes it changes on the fly, as you can tell, uh, much like our fucking streaming setup. Oh, wait, here, let me do some more s- cool switching. Oh, look, the poster's back up. Uh, so look for that. Uh, we appreciate y'all for listening and we hope you had a good one. I, I, I know this was a weird one with me running it solo. I hope it went all right. I got kind of high at the, um, for, for it with the, with the pen, I, if you guys are not seeing the video thing, this this fucking cigar thing, it's pretty, it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight. Uh, it also works pretty well. Uh, so, yeah, as always, everybody, we appreciate you. Let us know of the MMA podcast that you guys think we should be checking out each week. If you guys have recommendations, please let us know. TSOV Pod on Twitter. And until next week, go do something decadent. We out. Late. Liked by the sound of violence. about